What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the best damn fitness podcast in the world. Hey, check this out. The giveaway today is going to be really cool. Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro. It's the Prime Bundle. So it's great for correctional exercise. It's great to connect to muscles that may be lagging, get you to move better. Really doesn't matter what your goal is, by the way. Endurance, strength, uh, muscle building, fat loss. Prime and Prime Pro will benefit all of you. They're not workout programs yourself. They are programs you add to your workout programs, okay? And we're going to give them away for free to one of you viewers. You got to do the following. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all of those. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and give you free access to the Prime Bundle. Get both those programs for free. Also, huge sale going on right now. Two really popular MAPS programs we put together in what's called the Power Bundle. And then we did this huge discount. It's like way more than 50% off. Usually we do 50% off sales. This is way bigger than that. So check this out. Map Strong. This is a strongman inspired workout program. It's really great to build muscle, strength, stamina, a little bit of endur endurance, just like a strongman athlete. And then Maps Power Lift, it's going to get you really good at the squat, the deadlift, and the bench press. Like get those numbers way up, right? So get them, put them together, the power bundle. They would retail at $300. But right now, $79.99 will get you both lifetime access. So it's a huge, huge sale. So if you're interested, you want to sign up. Head over to mapsmarch.com. Once again, mapsmarch.com. All right, here comes the show. One of the best ways to exercise for longevity is to lift weights. All right, let's talk about Who'd this. Who would have known? Yeah, you, it, you know, when we talk about longevity, or should I say when longevity and exercise are talked about in mainstream uh, news or even studies... What they typically talk about is uh, cardiovascular activity, right? Just being active. Right. Well, we now have studies to support what we've known for a long time, which is that strength training has profound effects on longevity. And here's something in, even more interesting. A new study came out comparing or showing the effects of, of uh, resistance training on longevity. And, and by the way, this is these were everyday average people, whether they did body weight resistance training or gym type resistance training. They, they put that all together. So it's not like these are hardcore bodybuilders or whatever. They're just doing some form of strength training. And here's what they found that was different between the longevity benefits of strength training versus the longevity benefits of aerobic or cardiovascular training. Mm. Reduction in cancer risk. Oh, wow. Strength training had a significant reduction in cancer risk that we don't see necessarily. There's this great book called uh, uh, Resistance Training Revolution. That's right. Yeah, I've heard of that. <laughs> Stupid, shut up. Yeah. Guy's yeah. a little. The guy that wrote it's a little douchey, but I, but, I mean he's spot yeah, on with some of the things though, that he talked about. Yeah, yeah. no. It shows, so check this out. This is what the study says. That the, so this is the largest study to compare the mortality outcomes of different types of exercise. Strength training based exercise had a twenty three percent reduction in risk of premature death by any means, and a thirty one percent reduction in cancer related death. So. Uh, it's vital when it comes to cancer. And uh, again- What do they attribute that to? Uh, uh, in the terms muscle? Of the protective, uh, well, yeah. Um, but like in terms of the protective tissue with, around your organs, like what- uh, That is a very good question. I don't know. I right? think it would be more metabolic related. Wouldn't yeah. you think that? I would I, think I so because uh, building muscle is one of the most effective ways to improve insulin sensitivity. It's, right. a, it's almost a guaranteed way to do so. Like they, they've done studies on the severely obese- mm -hmm. And they'll have them gain some muscle, not lose any weight. And we'll see these great improvements yeah. in insulin yeah, in sensitivity. In terms of balanced hormone profiles and everything else that comes with strength training. It, it could be, but also, you know, the, through the process of, of, of breaking muscle down and building it, the body does release a lot of these kind of hormetic uh, compounds that, you know, if you looked at them at face value, for example, if you lifted weights and then studied someone's blood right afterwards, like, oh my God, that's damaging. Look at all the, the damage markers and infl inflammatory markers. But I think that that's part of the balance that keeps you healthy and living a long yeah. time. And that may be why it's well, anti-cancer. And to, if you think of the aerobic side of it, like inevitably you're going to hit repetitive stress issues, uh, which are going to come up. And on top of that, the oxidative stress. So those two factors alone, uh, you know, would, would seem to kind of pull it down a bit versus like strength training gives you a bit more ability to continue moving and, and continue that movement pain-free. Yeah, and, good point. And then here's something else, and this is not, uh, what they said in the study. This is my own speculation. And I, I had somebody very close to me who, sli who you know, over a year and a half uh, slowly died from cancer. And watching that and then researching it during that period and talking to cancer doctors, 
oftentimes what kills people is the treatment and their inability to continue to lose weight, their inability to continue to waste away. Mm. Well, let's say you go into, because it said cancer-related death. It didn't say cancer necessarily. Now, that's probably a reduction in cancer. has to be. But I wonder if there's a piece of that that says, hey, if you have an extra 20 pounds of muscle on your body and you do get cancer and you do get treatment and the treatment's successful, you're less likely to die mm. from the muscle wasting or the body wasting effects of the treatment. Because if you've ever seen somebody go on cancer treatment, oh, yeah. well, they atrophy yeah, like crazy. Atrophy, they lose tons of muscle. But yeah. if you have muscle and strength more than normal to begin with, there's more, you have more, more room to lose. More room to lose. So I wonder if that plays a role at all. But it, hmm. it definitely, there's a reduction in just rat in cancer as well. But very interesting. Now, do you yeah. do you predict that we're going to in the near future see doctors starting to yes. recommend this? Hundred percent. By the I, way, I go back and forth on that. By the way. Why wouldn't they recommend it? Just because the risk factor, and we know that the like, complexity, maybe. Yes, you know, and and because it, there's so many, there's so much red tape, like or with like when it comes to like the medical field, and, mm. and just like certifications, right? All the stuff that we 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 learned in certifications, we've we've unlearned as, as we've gotten yeah. more experience, right? It's like, oh wow, you know, stopping my clients at 90 degrees on their squat or on their yeah. bench press was, you know, yeah, the certification taught us that for safety reasons, but I know that for overall joint health, that's not ideal. In fact, I should train my clients through its fullest, their fullest range of motion. And so yeah. my fear is that even though the studies are continuing to point in this direction, and I know you highlight them all the time, and I want I want to believe that we're going to move in this direction, I still have a, a, a little hesitancy to come out and say, oh yeah, real soon here, doctors are going to be saying that because I feel like because of the red tape. Yeah, that's a good point. But by the way, I do want to also add that uh, the, the combination of cardiovascular activity and strength training had the, the largest reduction of risk of mortality. So mm -hmm. um, uh, combining the two is is probably your best bet when it comes to longevity. But, you know, back yeah. to, um, you know, what you were saying, I think it's more of this. I think that cardiovascular activity on its face appears to be uh, more simple and easy to apply, right? Because the, mm -hmm. the belief is, oh, I'm going to go for a run. I just got to put on my shoes and go run. It's a lower barrier to entry. Yeah. Like, oh, it's, oh, I'll just go run. That's not, that's not a problem at all. Now, Part of that is true. There's a there's a million and one different strength training exercises, and and you know you could do. There's five different ways to do each one. So and some of it's true, but some of it's also false. There's a bit of a false belief that the simplicity of you know just getting up and run means that you're going to go do so and it's going to be okay and you're not going to hurt yourself and it's not going to be a problem. And I think that's why people uh, they take for granted, or they, I should say they have a misunderstanding that oh I just go run and it's not a big deal. Running is a skill like anything, and and I'm picking running because that's the most common one. If you just go and run, but you don't run well, you are going to hurt yourself. You are going to create your you know problems for yourself. Whereas with strength training, the understanding is it's more complex, so you probably have a little bit more respect going into it. I better use the know the right exercises. I better learn the right technique. But there is again, there's truth too because well, the, the, strength the, training programming is much more complex. The risks are a little different though, right? Like the the running, um, although uh, I would say a majority of people that just start running um, will encounter some sort of an injury. The injuries are typically minor and or chronic pain is what you mm -hmm. would get more more likely, like in the knees or the hips, like their shins are probably most common with that. Where the risk of really hurting like your back or something, you know, doing a deadlift or a squat improper is a much higher risk where you could actually really hurt something. Um, that's why that's why I'm worried about it never going that way because, yeah, you're right. Running can hurt you. I mean, if you have poor mechanics, which most people do have, but you know, what are we talking about? Shin splints, uh, you know, bursitis. Um, you know, chronic knee pain. Yeah. We're not talking about uh, you know, breaking your back, or we're not yeah. talking about yeah. But you know, you know don't you see this sort of wedge uh, in between all that in terms of like the tonal machine or one of these other like they try to figure out how to add resistance training in one setting that's like they try and simplify it for uh, you know, your everyday average person more so. Maybe that's like sort of the bridge into uh, resistance training where doctors will get behind that. Yeah, I mean. And Again, we're thinking about like complex, you know, barbell exercise. Like the average person is like, there's some very basic exercises you could do. And also the data doesn't back the feeling that you have. Like if you look at the data, 
running creates more injuries oh, yeah. per number, person number one. than strength training. Right. And I don't think it's because of the potential, rather. I think it's the way it's treated. People tend to, you take the average person who's like, I'm going to try some strength training. Mm -hmm. They place more thought and caution on, I got to do this exercise right. Let me look it up. Let me make sure I'm doing the right technique. Let me do it slow and careful. Whereas the average person goes, I'm going to go run. I'm yeah, just going to run until I get tired. Yeah, part of that though is because the risk is higher. Because the 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 risk of doing a deadlift or a squat, I think it's the wrong. complexity that does it. They, they just don't know. People think they know with running. Yeah, but I mean, but con the complexity of it on on a movement like that, there's a higher risk of hurting yourself more than there is if you're going potentially. Out in time. Yeah, yeah, potentially. But it doesn't end up. That and, and you're way. right. Statistically, yeah. you're right. I mean, we know yeah. what the. I mean, it's the reason why we are constantly kind of harping people about going out and running. Yeah. It's not because we're anti-running. It's just that people think that that's a great form of exercise. My fear, again, though, is that the the doctors... But you bring up a good point. Is Maybe that's not squatting and deadlifting. Maybe we... Maybe, like, it becomes a thing where, where doctors start to promote, like, walking lunges. Yeah. You know, Body weight squats. Yeah, right. Like, instead... A push up off the Right, camera. right. Let's do... You know, maybe it looks like this really basic body that's weight the type of... That's the direction it's going. Right. And, and I think the doctors yeah. will promote it when the studies become... And they're already doing this. The studies are starting to become overwhelming the evidence is becoming overwhelming and you know doctors w rely on the fact that science has to feel somewhat settled and somewhat established for the, before they start and, it, and they take a little longer right the fitness industry and the health industry is always on the cutting edge so we were the ones that were saying things like eh you know you should, butter's probably better than margarine and doctors were still following the old guidelines until the evidence became so overwhelming that they started to reverse you know kind of what they said I think that we're probably 10 years away from strength training being, uh, the reason why I, I titled the resistance training revolution that, because I feel like it's coming anyway. I feel like there's going to be a revolution of the way people understand uh, and apply strength training. It's not going to be the, oh, that's just what bodybuilders do, or, oh, don't do that, it'll get too big. I think the average person, we're pretty close to the point where the average person be like, oh yeah, that's a great way to exercise for longevity. That is interesting. I was just thinking about that in terms of like, you know, clinical settings and yeah. you have these studies conducted where, you know, the gym setting, we have like clients that we've pulled data from and, you know, stuck with them for a really long period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, by the hundreds, by the thousands, we have all of this data, but it's obviously not used by scientific community because it's anecdotal. Uh, yep. Whereas, and this is where we kind of start to formulate our own opinions. Like, Hmm, I, don't, I didn't really see that happen within my clients. No. And also it's part of the reason, by the way, I don't blame like the, the studies and stuff and say, Oh, they were biased. It was, it's harder to study strength training than it is, you know, cardiovascular training. First of all, animal studies, you can put a rat on a treadmill, but you get a rat to lift weights. You got to get real creative to <laughs> figure that out. Right. I want to see that. You know, uh, getting people, even even studying uh, humans, right? Okay, if we're going to have them do resistance training, well, now we need to have a structure. We need to make sure. But if we just have them run on a treadmill, mm -hmm. it's easy to apply. So most of the studies done on strength training, uh, up until relatively maybe the last 10 years, were all done on athletics. So we knew it was great for athletics. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of health studies. There was some, but not much. Now, right. we're seeing lots of studies start to come out. We're starting to see that that weakness is a predictor of all-cause mortality, better than right. your ability to run on a treadmill, even they're showing. So, uh, so fascinating. What, so what tips it over? You know, what is, what's going to, what's going to need to happen? In M more studies like this. I mean, this just came out. Yeah. So more stuff like this is what's going to tip it over. Oprah you know, needs to take this and just run with it. You yeah, know, I know. She usually like starts it all. Yeah, and then you know, and celebrities uh, talking more about traditional strength training always yeah. helps, right? To, you know, give them credit because there's no. I know. I'm just it's it's. I'm just thinking of like our generation <laughs> yeah. growing up. It was always like somebody influential. I know. Was like this is the way we all need to <laughs> well, do it. <laughs> when we were growing up, if, if you saw anybody in media that was like healthy. They didn't lift weights. Like, oh, that health person. They were a runner, a marathon yeah. runner. If I thought about lifting weights with popular media, it was Arnold, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, bodybuilders or like athletes. That was all you had. That yeah. was it. And But now it's starting to change a little. There's still a stigma, right? But it's starting to change a little bit. So that's, uh, you know, that's all That's a good cool. point. I'm trying to think of besides like the Arnolds and Sylvester, like back in like the 80s and stuff, like who was like, dude, what even, were the body types besides that, right? Even picture that or like the, the, the Cindy Crawford model yeah, like look, right? Like, I guess. Yeah. Like, that's a good it. point. Even right now, if you were, if media was to create like an avatar of this healthy, long living person they would show them doing yoga running totally. and th maybe that's it swimming or something like that yeah everything is super zen you yeah. know that they promote for longevity they wouldn't show strength training even though strength training is profoundly uh beneficial for longevity yeah. which is kind of you know what but again i think it's 
starting to change. So it's good stuff. Mm. Anyway, I want to tell you guys a hilarious story about my my baby son who's turning out to be a little little tyrant. So <laughs> he's, he's I told still smashing everything. So I told you guys about when he gets he'll get angry and he'll just he'll walk through the house and just throw shit. You yeah. know. Yeah. And he's really defiant about it. Like he'll look at you and like he's got this look on his face like uh, you ain't gonna stop you me. You ain't right? gonna do nothing about it. Yeah. This. So I'm like part of me's like cool. He's got that rebellious you know. You got a little bit of my attitude in there, but part of me's like, better do what I say, buddy. So anyway, I was playing with him and he wanted to do something. I wouldn't let him do it. And so he got kind of angry and he'll do this thing right now. He'll squeeze your face. Like he'll let out his anger and squeeze his face. And I'm telling him, don't do that. Part of it's my fault because when he would do it before, I'd laugh. Mm -hmm. And then he did it to Jessica and she's like, oh, he can't be doing that. I'm like, you're right. I got to make sure he knows that he can hurt people or whatever. So I said, don't do that. And he looks at me upset like, and then he goes to do it again. And I said, if you do it again. I'm going to put you in timeout. So we started to do timeout with him. And he might be a little young, but we only put him in there for one minute. And we have the little, you know, that gate, you have those gates that you can like section off areas. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I made it into like a square. So he goes <laughs> inside. In the prison. Yeah. He goes <laughs> in jail. Like a little crate. <laughs> yeah. So he's in there just like, pump, like doing push ups. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get out. I'm going to let you have it. Yeah. Trust me. There's plenty of, plenty of air in there. There's light. It's not, like, <laughs> it's not a box. You know what I mean? Slide in his, his food underneath. Yeah. No, 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 no. And he goes uh, in for a minute. So what we do is we put him in there and then we have a timer, a visual timer, and we put it on a minute and we say, you have one minute. And so he's learning the timer or whatever. Right. So mm. he's doing this to me and he squeezed my face. And I said, I'm going to put you in timeout. And he gives me this dirty look. And I'm, t I'm like, I'm like trying not to laugh because the look he makes is just wants to crack me up. But I'm like, don't. I'm trying to be consistent. Mm -hmm. So then he goes and he squeezes my face. So it's all right, you're going to go in timeout. He gets off. This is true now. He gets off. He, he wants to climb down. I said, we're going to put you in timeout. He climbs down. He walks over. He grabs the timer. He puts it down by the gate and he stands by the gate and looks at me. You little shit. <laughs> He's like, oh, fine. Put me in timeout. That's exactly what he's telling Bro. me. Oh, here you go. Put me in. And he's looking at me like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> There's such little reflections, dude. I have. I'm like, what am I going to do about this kid? Dude, we've we've gone from, uh, you know how like poop jokes are the, are the best, right? In the beginning when they're like certain age and then it sort of progresses into just penis jokes. That's like the, <laughs> is, that, is that the natural the progression? inevitable <laughs> progression of that? And like, I, I forgot I about that. And uh, it's definitely my kid. Like, so but ever we were at uh, we were at this um, um, garden place. Like, we we're just getting like plants and stuff for the yard with Courtney. And he's like, he's grabbing some of the seeds that have like, like you know, random names for flowers. And so he would like start like taking some of the letters and trying to sound them out and be like, penis. Trying like, to make, try make it sound like penis or cock or oh whatever. And I'm like, dude, hey. And he's like, ah. I'm like, <laughs> calm down with that. <laughs> like, we, we joke like that at home. We don't do that in public, buddy. Uh, yeah, you know? that, that's the thing you got to be careful for. Yeah. My, so you guys know I have a dark sense of humor and uh, it might be one of the reasons why I got caught up, kicked off Instagram, but my, and it's very dark. It's what you see on Instagram is the rated G version of my sense of humor can be really bad. Like I can hang out with comedians and if you've ever heard comedians when they're on the stage, they can be terrible. You hear them together and it's like, oh my God, you guys make oh, terrible it's jokes. like the worst. I love it. Uh, doc, surgeons and nurses also have a terrible dark sense of humor, probably because they see so much. I, I learned this from training them. They right? see so much death, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I would get along great with them because we'd have this right. And so my son, I've told you guys, my oldest son's got this dark sense of humor too. That he got for me, and I've had to talk to him about like be careful who <laughs> when, when are the appropriate times. Yeah, to use like, it you don't want to make these jokes around the wrong people because I'll get offended. My daughter is the worst. Oh, she's worse, huh, bro? I can't even tell you the Did jokes. Did that surprise you or what? I yeah, because she's I, you know what maybe because I I assume because she's a girl she's yeah. not going to be like she might be a little more empathetic or whatever. Well, didn't she used to call you out for like saying bad words all the time? Yeah, she did. Yeah. But she, she, I can't even say the joke she told me. She told me some jokes <laughs> and, and she'd laugh and I'm like, that is hilarious, but I can't believe. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. I can't believe you said that, you know, and she thinks it's so funny. And she's like, yeah, I'm like, she goes, what did she say? She goes, I'm like, um, I'm really dark, but I'm sweet too. And she thinks it's funny. I'm like, oh, fuck. Uh, what have I done? Oh, wow. What have I done? Yeah, you got your hands I'm excited. Good... I'm excited for those years. It's going to be fun. Oh. Right now it's fun because I, he's like, well, I'm also going through this phase too of um, having to be very careful of what we say. And we're now repeating everything, oh, yeah. right? So like, yeah, now he's now, and he, it's on his terms though, right? So he has to be in the mood to want to, to like, 
try and say things like he'll go the whole day and, and babble and not really say anything. And then all of a sudden he'll be in a mood and he'll just be like saying everything you say and repeating. And y yesterday I was playing with him and I got him to do that for a minute where I'm like TV, computer, mom, dad, mozzie. And he was just like repeating, 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 repeating. And then Katrina goes over to get her phone to record it. Nothing. Oh, I know, <laughs> yeah, dude. I know, dude. And I feel like he thinks it's funny. Like he's just messing with her, you know? So, <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're a little like, okay, we got to be careful of what we what say. You got to do is be careful when he says a word wrong and it sounds like something else. Don't <laughs> laugh. I, do, I know. Yeah. Cause my, 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 young, but isn't that half the fun though too? Cause that's, <laughs> it's not when they say it around like the wrong place. Like my, uh, my oldest said instead of truck, he'd say fuck. Yeah. yeah. So my once we learned, I laughed about it because I thought like fuck, fuck, and I laugh about it. Well, mm, then he thought fuck. it was funny, and he would say it in All the time. restaurants, and yeah. then people think that you let your kid cuss. Like, or Jeez, man, what are you saying around your uh, kid? I dude? could see where that would be a little embarrassing. Like, yeah, that. dude, You're like oh, I don't really let him act like that. No, it's hilarious, <laughs> dude. You know, what? I've been watching this. Uh, there's a series on Netflix. So this, so Jessica and I almost never watch garbage, shit, processed food TV. We never, <laughs> almost never watch it. But every once in a while. No, it's good every now and then. We'll watch a show, and it's usually a reality dating show of some sort. And yeah. what we do, and she's going to get mad, I'm, I'm, I'm telling her about everyone about this, but whatever, is we're very cynical. We watch the show, <laughs> mm -hmm. and we- Judge everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> oh, we do the same. Hard. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's like, oh, and I'll, I'll predict, I'll say like- What is that in I human- I used to love Rock of Love for that reason. Uh, what right, is it yeah. in human nature? Now, I've admitted this too, but I, I tend to want to do it when I feel sick because I feel bad about myself. So you it's my like way of- like Yeah, this is the way I feel better about myself is like, oh, even when I'm at my worst and I feel terrible inside, yeah. stuff like that, at least I ain't got to like them. So that's kind of like my attitude when I'm watching shit like that. What is it that drives you guys on I, a- It's on just a, drama. I guess we're just drawn to drama yeah. and gossip, you know? Yeah. And it feels safe. I love safe seeing people too. try to like- like uh, you know, get <laughs> like get in the other person's pants, you know, and like their their approach to it and all that. I don't know. It's just funny to well, me. The show, first of all, the premise is ridiculous. What they, is it? They meet. It's, so it's Love Is Blind. Oh, I saw. I saw yeah, the first. This is season two, season right? Two. I saw the first. Season, season. one was better. They meet in these garbage. pods and then they just talk to each other. And then based off that, if you fall in love, you ask him to marry you. It's like within seven days, and they're crying. Oh, I love her. And Jessica and I are like. Seven days. You fucking didn't even know that. Like, we're just making fun of them the whole time, right? But they're going through this whole thing. They're doing it. And then we get cynical about the people themselves. And so I'm predicting... Who's going to stay together? Who's going to get a big blowout argument? Yeah, who has, yeah. like, trauma issues? <laughs> like, there's yeah. this one girl in there. She's, like, 30. And you could tell... And this is what... Jessica got kind of mad that I said this. But she, you could tell this girl was probably hot in her early 20s, but probably partied a little too hard. And you can tell <laughs> yeah. she's past her prime with that. She's yeah, lost her power. Yeah, yeah. And she hasn't figured that out yet. And the reason why I say that is because she has no other, like she has no personality. She has no other skills. She developed uh, nothing else because uh, she was probably smoking in her 20s, which got all the attention. She could do whatever she wanted. Yeah, yeah. And now she's just, she's starting to lose it. She so, just like talks about sex the whole time, has no other. Yes, like, doesn't I know, I know what to do about, when there's yeah. when they can't see her. And so I, did they, okay, I, I watched the first season. I didn't watch any of this one. Uh, in fact, I don't even know if I finished the first season, but Katrina and I did watch a little bit of that. Do they recap? Because what I'm always curious about is. Oh, where are they now? Yeah, where are they now? Like, None so, of them are together. There's no way. Did uh, that's did they recap it? Did they tell you what happened? No, I didn't see it. Oh, okay, so yeah. Flawed. Yeah, see, I want to know if they were together still, if they even. even well, some of of them like imploded almost immediately like at the end of the show they kind of told like yeah. who you know like a, a couple months later like who was still kind of doing well who wasn't like almost all of them were like <laughs> imploded except for like maybe two i mean i feel like a, a like a like a, a therapist would tell any normal person that the fact that you would even go on a, a television show like this that right away it's automatic. like they would already tell you like you're not in a good place yes. yet to, to be in a relationship yes. so the whole concept like i just uh, the I whole feel thing's like flawed, it dude. collapses on itself just in that you have so a self-selection bias yeah. right. right of pe who's going to go on a show right desperate losers right. genuinely to trying to like find a wife right. or a so they already have problems they need to work yeah. out and they're inside. not because yeah. be honest they're not genuinely looking for a wife or husband they're going on to be on tv yeah. And what they're thinking is, well, if Fame I find horse, someone that's yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah, and then they're in the 
drama of it. The cameras are on them. They're in the environment. They really want to feel what they what they think they feel. So yeah. they make themselves feel. So here now I'm being cynical. This is what I talk, this is how we talk yeah. while we watch the show. As <laughs> so we break the whole thing down That's and make funny. fun of the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, but you've seen. It's the thing is we know the production end of that, right? And like how they have to like you know build them up totally. and like and give them drinks and make sure they say totally. the right thing yes. and all that. So stuff. I know so Doug does this. I, I without even asking him, he's got to do this because I think I only do it because of him. Now I'm curious if you guys do this now. Katrina makes fun of me. Because we're now in the media space, yeah. so uh, we'll be watching. I feel it. so gross. I'll be. I know it does feel. It does feel <laughs> gross saying it, right? So I, I, when I'm watching something, like I'll break down the set to her. Like, oh, they're totally having to shoot all kinds. Of, I know. Like, there yeah. was a, I was watching. Um, I was Some watching this, this, this right movie. Here. Right, it was. Uh, it's the uh, the prequel to uh, the um, the western one. I like. What's the um, uh, Yellowstone. Thank you. The prequel to that, right? And there's a scene where, and this is like in 1893 or whatever, right? So it's like 1893 or some sometime around there. And there's a scene where it's nighttime and he's in the inside the tent with his kids and his wife, and you're and it's completely lit. And yeah. like you, I just that would never dawn on me before. Yeah. I'm like, there's a campfire outside. Yeah. They're in a tent. Yeah. Or there's it'd be dark yeah. as fuck. Yeah, it'd be dark. There's no flame this in there. Fake. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, and it's like they're all their faces are so lit. I'm like, oh my god, they got backlighting over here and they're doing this. Like, ruining the movie. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> I never would do that before, but because of what we're in and I and I'm around it so much. Now, do you do that, Doug? I do. Of course yeah, you do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to it's hard to unsee it. Once it you is. Know and then the it tricks. kills the moment because yeah. you're like, there's like six dudes right now holding, you know, holding lights yeah. over this like romantic moment or totally. whatever. Yeah. 100%. So, yeah. Every now and then you see the boom mic like come down. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, like really bad No, there was one it. show, I can't remember it on Netflix. I can't remember what it was, but it was basically a bunch of, I mean, they, you know, the, the, the premise was young, attractive, people going on an island you told me about this yeah 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 and the goal what they're gonna hook that was when up. i had covid okay yeah and <laughs> they're like and they're like trying to hook up with each other and have temptation sex and, island bro. something like that right yeah. something like that right and they're gonna they're all about partying mm -hmm. and hooking up right and then they get to and jessica and i are watching this and we're watching this this was a while ago and they meet up and within a day the possessiveness starts to, to happen like the dude is flirting with one girl which mm -hmm. is cool and they're like oh and they're talking all sexual because supposedly they're all you know horny and fucking whatever but then she goes and talks to another guy and then the dude becomes jealous or vice versa the girl becomes jealous yeah. and jessica and i are fucking laughing and we're like you know if they made this with a bunch of and this is true now if they made a show like that with a bunch of sexy horny 40 something year olds that shit would go to sex right away everybody would have said nobody would give a shit it's because they're a bunch of 20 year olds if it was a bunch of 40 something year olds that met yeah. up on this island yeah. they'd flirt with you probably hey oh you think she's hot too cool yeah. that's all you guys all want to do this that's well all. i know there's definitely like uh i mean and <laughs> just we, all these games we, we saw that we saw that uh, remember we saw that evolution with um you know it's our generation that grew up with real world right and the yeah. original one was pure so just like biggest loser i felt was pure the first season yeah. of those when they were first kind of testing the idea that's true and then what ends up happening is they find out like oh they cast people specifically for, for the sure drama. so yeah so that all those shows you have to send in a video yeah. you tell your backstory yeah. here's ryan he's a white supremacist yeah be right. On the, you know, <laughs> yeah right yeah, here's johnny he's a blm activist yeah they're gonna and, be living together uh -huh. yeah, so, then they, so they totally set that all up and i i've known people that actually have been on those shows and they'll even tell me like, you know, there's cameras everywhere. And a lot of times what will happen is there will be something organically that happens. Like a they'll make like, them recreate it. They'll make them recreate I know, it. Dude. They'll be like, they'll get up in the, the morning. They'll be like clothes, some sort of a fight. Same time of day. Yeah. And so then they'll be like, hey, stage that whole thing. And then they'll make them kind of like fight again. And it's not the real original fight. Do you guys remember um, the Chappelle show where he made fun of the real world? Oh, no, no. Okay. So if you guys remember in the real world, I don't remember what season it was. But there was like, it was a lot of drama. This is from the MTV one. And there was that one black dude that was a comedian and everybody kicked, they wanted to kick him out. Of the, the skinny guy? Yeah. Yeah. I and they kicked him out because he lost his temper, right? Yeah. And Chappelle basically is like, yeah, dude, you put him in a house with a bunch of crazy white people. Of course you're going to. So then what he did is he created the skit <laughs> yeah. where there was the reverse. Yeah. And this white dude comes in and they fucking terrorize him. And then finally he freaks out and everybody looks at him like, man, you, you're, you're you unstable. But this is after they like, one of the dude bangs his girl. Yeah, another another yeah. dude stabs his dad. Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's such a great skit, dude. Oh, Chappelle, dude. It's one of my favorites. It's so good. Anyway, so um, so I'm trying something new from uh, mphormones.com. Uh, oh, what are you doing? Um, NAD. Look at you, dude. I know, bro. Now you see, What's going on, Max? You give me, you give me a doctor. Max. 
who's going to, uh, you know, eggs. Who's, hey, come on, you give me a doctor who's going to, you know, uh, monitor me and access to things and I'm monitored by a doctor. Yeah, yeah. It's like supplements. Yeah, you yeah. know how I am with supplements. Yeah. So NAD uh, injections. So oh. NAD sub Q. So it's, so it's uh, you inject it, you know, sub Q, which is like in the fat. Okay. Right? So school me on this because one, I think somebody asked a question one time and I was like, I have no idea yeah. what that bullshit is. Uh, and then we were reading Tony Robbins' book, and he I think he has a whole chapter dedicated to NAD. Yeah. So enlighten me on what what do we know about this so far? So the longevity, now the, the studies aren't super clear yet. And one of the challenges is taking it orally, um, it tends to get destroyed in the gut. So there's a couple ways people are getting around this. Um, but in, it, the way that it's been used in the past was uh, intravenous or injectable, right? Sub-Q because it bypasses the, the digestive system or whatever. But the longevity benefits, the, it, it increases the length of the telomeres on your DNA, which is an indicator of your, bio, I guess your, your cellular um, age. Mm -hmm. It improves mitochondrial function. People will say they have more energy, they feel better, they're less inflamed. Now I've tried supplements, I don't wanna say who, but we've had companies send us and I felt nothing, I noticed nothing. So I said, you know what? People keep, the, especially the biohackers, talk so much about NAD and precursors like NMM and other stuff. Um, and then, of course, Tony Robbins wrote about it uh, in his book. Um, so I said, you know what? Let me try it. Let me try it. So I just tried it. I haven't had been on it long enough. Okay. But I'll let you guys know. Now, is you know, this like a localized effect or systemic? So is it like no, no, no. the site of injection? Is it like affect like all your cells? Oh, no. It's the whole body. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't have to inject it on my whole you yeah, no, I just. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. I just like uh, where, where you get all the benefits. You're like from. a really young gut. Well, like, well, yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> you're, you're just targeting your gut. Like, what's happening? No. no, it's systemic. Are now? Are you? I mean, those. It's the twice things, a week, by the way, injecting. And are are you supposed to feel anything? Like, should you see increased energy yeah. and energy, recovery? Like, yep, all that stuff. So more energy, uh, better sleep, recovery, um, just general well being. So we'll see. We'll see if I notice anything uh, from taking it. But I'm, I've tried that. I'm already doing the ibut uh, uh, ibutamorin, which is what, MK677. That's a um, peptide that you take orally. It raises growth hormone. Now I thought that I, I can tell. I thought I heard you on the phone with either Dr. Ren or Dr. Todd talking about potentially putting some stacks together like this. Yes. Is that happening? Yeah. So the peptide world is very interesting to me. I don't know a ton about it. Um, I, I've always been um, a bit skeptical, mainly because people are – so this is how people will get their peptides typically. Either you go through a doctor, and it's usually hormone um, therapy places that will do it, which that's fine. You're under the, the supervision of a doctor. They're ensuring that what you're getting is what you're getting. But a lot of people go online and will get this stuff in this kind of gray market where it's like research chemical. I think that's a terrible idea. You don't know what you're getting. You don't know if you're taking too much. You don't know what the deal is. They're not very well studied. You're not being monitored, so you don't know how it's actually affecting your body. Um, so that's why I've always stayed away from those types of things, but because I'm being monitored, um, and you know, I trust these, these doctors, um, I, I try and couple them out. So I beat them more and I could tell I sleep really good and I have very vivid dreams. And so far it's only been maybe like a couple weeks that I've been on it, maybe a week and a half. Yeah. And I think I'm noticing some difference in my, my skin and my nails. What makes, what makes peptides so much safer than SARMs? Well, a SARM is attaches to the androgen receptor. Okay. And the goal of a SARM is to act like testosterone, but without some of the side effects of testosterone. That's the goal. They're very, they haven't been studied very long and they're a poor substitute for testosterone or, thing. or anabolics, right? So if you're, if you're going to, if you can get on TRT, like there's no, a SARM was a stupid thing to take. There'd be no reason to take it. If, if you want to take a SARM because you don't want to, because you want to be like you're on steroids, I think you're even better off going with anabolics because they've been around for so long. Right. So SARMs to me is weird. It's silly. I don't, I'm not a big uh, supporter of them. Um, now, peptides are different. Peptides don't do that. Peptides, there are peptides that increase or improve the ability of your body to recover yeah. and heal, like BPC-157. I've, I've heard the, the majority of people that I know that have done it have done it in, in terms of like he, the healing process and yes. speeding that up. Yes. There's also um, obviously peptides that help release growth hormone. Um, uh, so those are different. Those are, uh, have been tested. Um, and again, you could be monitored. There's a peptide, I don't remember the name of it, that has been shown to increase sexual desire in men and women. 
you take it 30 or 45 minutes before. Oh, I don't need any of that, dude. Which is really interesting. <laughs> but anyway, I am. I'm, in, I'm talking with them about... But here's the cool thing about peptides. You could go to... For example, if you go to mphormones.com and set up an appointment and talk to them, and you don't... You're not going to go on hormone therapy. Testosterone levels are fine. Hormones are fine. You can still go on peptides with them and, and be monitored and stuff and try that route, which I think is pretty fascinating. Yeah, and is there is there nothing in in the peptide world that is has showed any sort of adverse effects? Do we know like as far like I know SARMs can be a sketch. Like yep. we and I know there are some people that oh yeah I'm fine, but then my eyesight or my sight's turning yellow or some yeah, show. you no, hear the, weird the, weird stuff like that. Is there anything like that with peptides? Or they so far the ones that they're working with. Pretty safe. And now your uh, your potential risks would be with what they do. So like if you take something that raises growth hormone, then you may you want to monitor your blood sugar and your insulin because uh, growth hormone goes up, insulin sensitivity goes down. So if you're prone or predisposed to diabetes uh, or insulin insensitivity, then you probably don't want to take anything that makes your growth hormone go up. So that would be something like that. But this would be a question I would ask. Yeah, this is, I, and I'm assuming that, I mean, when you go, at least when you go through uh, regenerative, like when you go through them, they do your blood work first. That's what then I Then mean. you ask those questions. They monitor And everything. they would tell you like, oh, you're a candidate for this or no, you're not a candidate for this yep. anyways. Yeah. Speaking of mixing things together, you know what I've been adding to my caffeine stack in the morning? The, re <laughs> the red juice from Organifi. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's fire, bro. With the caffeine. Yeah. Oh, like bro. Caffeine so I normally, or... I normally use that in replace when I've decided to come. That's the smart way to do it. You're coming off caffeine, do yeah. the red juice to help with the side effects. You get some energy. The stupid way, but fun way to do it is to combine them. Mm -hmm. And boy, you get so fire. Are they uh, are they not necessarily um, counterproductive? Or Synergistic. Okay. Because the rhodiola and the red juice is got mild stimulant effects. So you take that with the your normal pre-workout. So whatever pre-workout you do, you probably want less of that when you add the red juice. But it's like it's a it's a bit of a combo. Yeah, when I transition to more hit style training, cardiovascular type training, you know, like I, I switch over to red juice every time, dude. It always helps with that. Yeah. You know what was one of my favorite things about uh, trying that when we first got introduced to it was actually the pumps. That's oh, from yeah. the, I, beet, the beetroot powder. The beetroot powder, yeah. I got great pumps from that. Like, as if I was taking the, the best NO Explode product that yeah. was out there, I got the same type of effect from something natural like that. I thought that was really well, cool. Well, beetroot powder uh, will raise your nitric oxide more than citrulline will, which is in pre-workout. So then why isn't that, why why aren't most of these, like, nitric oxide, you know, products, why are they not derived from that then? Or is it? They're starting to, you're starting to see now come mm -hmm. out more where they're starting to add it. Citrulline does that too, but uh, it might be cheaper. And is it because citrulline add. is it citrulline or beta alanine that make, gives you the the tingles? Beta alanine. Oh, that's yeah, the beta. That doesn't have any. That doesn't increase nitric oxide, but it does reduce the because I know why they, fatigue. I know why they put stuff like that in there to feel yeah. right. It's just yeah. like the bubbles and the shampoo and the toothpaste. It ain't doing shit for your hair or yeah. for your teeth, but it feels like it is. Speaking of which, back yeah. to the NAD. You know what raises NAD in your body? Niacin, but. You don't want to take big dose of niacin. You ever done that before? Yeah, yeah. No, Terrible. Start sweating. No, that. thanks. Yeah, I'll sweat my, <laughs> my balls off. Oh, I look yeah. like a lobster. A lot of, yeah. by the way, a lot of pre-workouts use that as like a hack, right? I know. Like you take niacin and then all of a sudden within 20 minutes you're sweating and you yep. think your pre-workout is so amazing, like, but it's just the niacin in you. Totally. Yeah. Hey, I want to ask you, Justin, I overheard yeah. you talking to, I don't remember who it was on staff, but you were talking about the supplies that you're getting for your dog from public goods. Yeah. Are I mean, you all public goods with that stuff? Yeah, I, I I switched over to public goods, like for just random stuff, like um, you know, dog shampoo and for treats. And so I, I usually give them some treats to to try and retrain them. So like, dude, behaviors the, it, it changes all the time if we leave them too long or like we go on trips and things. We come back, it's almost like you're starting over again. And so I've been working with, especially my my Weimaraner, who's just like high strung. So I'm always having to kind of train him, and I get treats like to help with that but uh also too um like around my property i don't know what it is about this season but there's just ticks everywhere oh, like wow. and maybe it's because of like there's so many deer that come through um because of the fruit and things on my property um but every time he goes out and he runs through the woods and everything he comes back he's got ticks on him and so oh, i'm like shit. pulling them off and then i'm throwing them in the shower and i'm looking at you know so i'm just like going through shampoo like crazy it seems i don't know they even they have dog shampoo on there they do uh -huh. Dude, they have everything well, yeah. i know brother it, i know i went through I, that and just saw it i, was I like, have yes. to get better about every time i'm looking for something 
mind to just go there first yeah. because every time I've looked for, I'm like, shit, they have this too. You know what's funny is we pay attention to the chemicals and shit in our our products for ourselves. You ever look at like like traditional dog shampoos and dog food and stuff so like that? So much less regulated. I mean, they're getting Terrible. better now, but yeah. it, but that's like a marketing point, right? Like that for animals, they're always like, oh, we don't, but the standard is really bad. Yep. Well, it's it's getting better though, because that's, I mean, look at the way we are with our pets today though, just compared to 20 years ago. That's yeah. true. I mean, it's- That's true, dude. I mean, I remember be, when I was a kid, if the dog was sick, my well, dad was like, oh, let him eat some grass. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, no, it's, it's like, it was like commonplace for them to have a bunch of tumors and like, you know, cancer. That was common. You're, you're just, just like, leave them okay. outside. You know what I'm saying? That's like, true. Like I think pet- it's because we're richer, right? We're wealthier. People are wealthier now. Oh, yeah. So they treat their dogs. No, like totally. I mean, and how many places could you... Br- like Now it's like, especially when you go places like in LA or... I mean, grocery stores allow dogs walking around. Dude, how many people don't even walk yeah. their dogs anymore? They carry them. Yeah. I see it all the time. That's I think it's the weirdest thing. So just carry their dog everywhere. What are you doing? I blame yeah. the Kardashians for that. Or or, or a baby carriage then? Yeah. They're, they're, they're pushing no, the dog. it's not a baby. Was, was it one of you guys Stop on the plane it. next to someone with like a little dog? Who was that? Yeah, that was me. Oh, it was you, right? Some way, like Doug got on the plane. I heard Doug, like, d- like d- the bag was like moving or something. I was like, whoa, what's in the bag? <laughs> <laughs> Some lady was flying. What kind of dog was it? Do you know? It was a... Uh, Maltipoo, I think. Oh, it's a right. yeah, Maltese poodle mix. Oh, it was a cute, cute. dog. Yeah, yeah. The dog came out at the end of the flight. Looks oh. a lot like our dog. Um, I was going to say, yeah, you, yeah except a lot bigger. Well, I was you said say, our. Like, you and you and Adam have a dog together. Yeah. Now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have a place? No. I feel like you guys are <laughs> yeah. something weird no, going on. No, Brianna, Brianna's dog. Yeah. Yeah. Bella. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hey, look. Do you want to have a home gym, but hate the kind of equipment they sell for home gyms? It's crap, right? Try PRX Performance. PRX makes commercial-grade home gym equipment. But here's the best part. They consider the fact that most people just don't have tons of space. So, for example, they have squat racks, super sturdy, super quality, but they fold into the wall. Literally, it's like six inches off the wall. Then you pull it off the wall, very stable. Now you can squat, bench, overhead press. They have benches that fold in the wall. They have weights and weight racks that go into the wall. Great quality, amazing stuff. We have our whole studio here outfitted with PRX. Oh, and by the way, you can do payment plans, right? So if you want to pay monthly like you're going to a gym, except you own this gym, you can do that. So go check them out. Head over to prxperformance.com forward slash mind pump and you'll get 5% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from P. Erickson Live. What? Why do you recommend Prime and Prime Pro as the best programs for trainers working with clients? Wow. Yeah, that's a good question. Why? So let's change the question a little bit just so people who don't have the programs or maybe not familiar with them kind of understand why a little bit. Why would you recommend correctional exercise-based programs uh, for trainers or why would those be the most important? Well, mainly because correctional exercise, which really refers to exercise that helps somebody – move better, reduces uh, poor recruitment patterns, helps them connect better to muscles they may not be very well connected to. Um, All those things, by the way, individualized, right? So, Mm. because everybody's a little different. When you do that for someone, regardless of their goal, regardless of the way they train, they're going to do better. So if they're an endurance athlete, they're going to perform better. If they're there for longevity, they're going to do better. If they're trying to build muscle or strength, they're going to do better. That's the one consistent thing that you should find in any program, regardless of the person or the goal. And of course, it needs to be individualized because what could be correctional for one person could be a waste of time for another or maybe even yeah. make an issue worse for them. But that being said, uh, you know, Prime and Prime Pro are correctional exercise-based programs. So it doesn't matter what your client's goals are or how you're training them. You want to incorporate that into the routine to maximize whatever it is they're looking yeah, for. Yeah, you got to consider the structural integrity of the entire body. Like, what are we building on top of? Uh, a lot of times, like, we as trainers, I mean, the first thing we want to find is any kind of imbalance, any kind of uh, glaring type of dysfunction that we can address so that way uh, – if if not immediately um, alleviate pain, at least you know prevent it from happening in the future, and, and be able to set them on the right foot going forward towards their goal. So, and you can do this a lot of times simultaneously with whatever fat loss goal, whatever you know muscle building goal they have. But I mean, really, this is the basis of our value is to be able to address these issues and these imbalances. So that way, um, you know, they can move properly and also be able to accomplish goals and keep that going and keep that longevity in their program. One of the um, single best or most important certifications that I ever received was 
the correct the corrective exercise specialist. Um, and unfortunately for me, that was one of my last ones I did. I think it was like number seven or eight that I did. And the, all the ones that I did before that um, didn't even come close to providing as much value as the corrective exercise specialist certification did for me. And it was because what I realized, and Sal, you were alluding to this, is that every single one of my clients uh, needs this. I don't care if you're in great shape, an athlete, um, yeah. you, especially athletes, right? There's some of the most dis dysfunctional clients were actually somebody who was an athlete for many years. But even more importantly, uh, I, at that point, I knew how to do a squat assessment because I went through NASM. So NASM taught like the fundamental you know, squat assessment. But to be completely honest, like I wasn't great at what to go from there. So I do a squat assessment and then I'd see, oh, their arms fall forward, their knees cave in. And, you know, we had a little chart to be like, oh, this this is wrong or this is right. wrong. But then from there, I, I wasn't really qualified to build a routine around to correct it, mm -hmm. to fix it, to help them. And yet everybody that I ever did a squat assessment had some sort of breakdown, if not a ton of breakdown, which, by the way, Prime is our version of the squat assessment. We actually have a squat assessment in there. We have the overhead assessment, and then we have the windmill or rotational assessment in there. So it, we've bolstered what we thought was the most ideal assessment. So as a trainer, here you have, uh, which is one of the things that you will do with every single client is an assessment, mm -hmm. right? It should be every first session, should be every uh, potential client. So if you offer a free opportunity to meet you, you should be going through some sort of an assessment process, which is MAPS Prime. So, And then from there, you're going to point out to this client, regardless of their goals, build muscle, lose body fat, overall health, get rid of pain, no matter what their goal is, you're going to assess them and then point them in the right direction to correct any of these deviations that you see, which is now Prime and Prime Pro, because Prime Pro goes even deeper with every single joint. So the, and then this also made sales way easier for me. So once I once I had this this tool in my tool belt, I became a a much better trainer at helping my clients. And then it actually became even easier to sell clients because I now had the the, the knowledge to be able to break somebody down just by seeing them squat or do an overhead press and and then be able to tell them, oh my God, this is what's going on with you. And I, and you've said this before, I think Sal on the show, like. A client like thinks you're a magician when mm -hmm. you can have them just do a body weight squat and then go, oh, did you have an injury to your left knee? And they go, oh my god, I had surgery yeah. on that like 20 yeah. years ago. How did you know that? Yeah. Well, what I know is you that, ever have neck pain? Like, how yeah. can you tell? Well, how I know is that your body has been uh, overcompensating on the opposite side because it moved away from the pain for so many years, which has caused this imbalance in your body. And I'm sure you have low chronic pain here and here, and you can start pointing all this stuff out, and you look like a genius. And not only that, but then I could go take them on the floor, and which, by the way, is in Prime and Prime Pro, the movements to address these issues and show them like relief instantly. Immediately. Yeah, yeah immediately they, you can get them to move better by it's showing- It's life-changing for some people. Yeah, and, so, and, I, and I'm sure this question is mostly directed at me because I know I passionately say you are stupid if you are a trainer and you don't own these two programs. It is, the, it is literally all of our certifications that we've accumulated over all of our years, plus our experience wrapped into- how would I assess a client on day one? What tools would I need yeah. to set a program up to address any and everybody that will come my way? Yep. Those are those two yeah. programs. There's, there's two, and there's two main ways that you like you could pick an exercise for your body, right? One way is the easy. I don't want to say easy, but the more common way, which is what part of my body do I want to yeah, develop? What am I working on? Today? Yeah. What do I want to? How do I want to look? Right. The other way is what's the best exercise that's going to help me move better. Okay. And they're both they're both valuable, but the move better I'll argue is even more valuable because without moving better over time, you start to lose the aesthetics um, as well. You start to look worse because you're not moving well because you can't activate muscles best. So I'll give you a silly example. If someone has really bad forward shoulder, like really bad forward shoulder, and it's time to do a back exercise, I can choose a pull down or I can choose a cable row, right? The cable row is gonna be far more appropriate for a person with really bad forward shoulder than a pull down because a pull down might actually make the forward shoulder worse, which then can cause shoulder pain, neck pain, and lots of other issues. By the way, you can go, we, we, we went through some of the most important parts of these programs and teach you and walk you through, and you can follow along and do them yourself so you can experience for yourself right. um, for free. So you can go to mapsprimewebinar.com and you can go to primeprowebinar.com. They're totally free. Justin is in one. 
teaching you how to do the assessment and the movements associated with each assessment. And Adam is in the other one, yeah. showing you some of his favorite correctional exercise movements. And you follow along, do them, and they're free and they're extremely valuable. So I recommend everybody go check those out. Yeah, and one more point just for the personal trainer and to add value is a lot of times like we don't have control of what a lot of our clients do outside of the gym. And I think that this addresses a lot of things that they can work on, you know, uh, besides what you're working on in terms of like muscular development and all these other like specific goals they have with that time frame that they have with you in the gym. So now we can build and establish rituals that will alleviate pain We'll, we'll present them in better posture and we'll get them, um, you know, to, to move better and everything else while they come back and visit you. Uh, so that way, you know, they can really have a, an effective uh, use of time. This, this is literally for everybody. And there's this uh, misunderstanding that the correctional work or correctional exercises for old people or injuries or only people that have problems. But a good trainer will be able to, so the most common, two primary goals, build muscle or burn body fat. You do that, you do those better with, if you have better. That's right. And you, and, and you can, you can program both. You can build a routine that is going to build muscle and or yeah. help you and lose I'll body argue fat. And if you don't include the individualized correctional stuff, you'll build less muscle. That's right. You won't do it as fast. That's why, that's why this, the learning this was so pivotal, I think, for my career as a trainer, both like helping my clients and then also being able to sell and be able to get more clients, like which is obviously important for trainers. Yeah, it's a major you, selling point. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you still don't have this and you're a trainer, like you, th th it'll be one of the single most important investments that you'll ever make as far as helping you with your your training. Next question is from Claymation fourteen. What are the benefits of doing front? squats versus back squats. That is a very different feel um, in the exercise. A, a back squat, you're going to get more forward lean. You're going to get more of the posterior chain, so more glutes, maybe more hamstring. You could probably squat more with a back squat. Most people can. A front squat is going to make you more upright. You're going to get more knee flexion and extension, more quads work, and you can feel it. You'll feel one more in the quads, one more in the glutes, uh, they're both pretty quad intensive, but that's the bigger the bigger difference. And then core activation is very different in both mm. exercises. Mm. The core is very active in both movement. I feel more low back in the back squat and more core um, in the front squat. Um, and I think they're both exceptional exercises. I, I know a lot of people do back squats, don't do front squats. I think that's a big mistake. They're different exercises. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, it's it's that simple. It's like it, they're not. Um, it's not either or. Right. Or, you know which one's better? So much to. It's like, and I know this is an extreme example, but it's like saying squats and bench press. Why squats? Why bench press? It's like, well, both. They yeah, they, right. they both have tremendous value in your routine. Uh, you're also front squats require more shoulder mobility just to be able to do them too. So. They're, they're different movements. They both uh, add tremendous value. Um, programming it, you can program front squats and back squats uh, in the same routine, in the yep. same in the same cycle. Um, I've done times where I'm really focused on the back squat and like my whole uh, cycle mm -hmm. you know, or phase is all back squat. And then the next cycle is all front squat. And I try to improve that. So there's not like a, you, you have to do it a certain way, but they're, they're both such valuable movements and exercises or programming. Like you have to have it, I think, in a routine. How you put it in there is up to you. Yeah, I think the back squat gets a lot more glory and mainly because the emphasis of trying to activate your posterior chain because we just don't um, naturally focus on the posterior chain throughout our daily movement and habits uh, throughout the day so it's very important to uh, you know strengthen your posterior chain however uh, you know the front squat is is very translatable to, to any kind of functional um, feet that you're going to face uh, throughout the day. Picking objects up in front of you and yep. having that load and being strong in that is very important. So it's a, it's a great exercise. I also found it as a, as a good tool to uh, teach proper squatting mechanics. I found that uh, getting a client to do a front squat or a goblet squat Easier. first. Especially with that forward lean. That's what I mean. Yeah. So because everybody- I would has, do it with a broomstick. I'd have them put the Right. So every, uh, most people have a tendency to, to fall forward when they do a back squat, and then you have it loaded on your back, so it promotes that even more. And if you don't have good mechanics, you don't understand the exercise very well, you, it's it can be a challenge for a trainer yeah. to get a client to mimic that. An easy kind of hack for a trainer to get a, a client into better squat form is to teach the front squat or a goblet squat first so they kind of get that chest high, upright, good posture. 
and you know breaking at the knees and the hips at the same time they'll learn that i think easier most clients easier on a front squat first mm -hmm. um with lightweight and then progress them to a back squat so that's a small little trainer hack for the trainers that are listening um, I, a lot of times I will teach like how we talk about, uh, I teach now, or I, you know, later on in my career started to learn that teaching an incline bench press was actually easier to get clients in the better form because it promotes just better posture for benching, uh, and the incline than it does the flat bench. I feel the same way about a front, a front squat, a front squat teaches better mechanics to a, a newbie to get them ready for a back. I always, squat. I would start clients with front squats before yep. we do back squats. Next question is from Wesley 762. What is the difference between doing a lift and actually practicing a yeah, lift? So this this probably means what's the difference between like I guess working out with a lift and practicing a lift. Mm. The one okay, working out with a lift is the goal is typically fatigue intensity. I'm training my legs, I'm training my back, I'm training my shoulders. Practicing a lift is all about viewing it as a skill. Like I'm trying to get better at this particular movement. And so that typically looks like less intensity, yeah, lighter very, weight, very slow. Emphasis on form and technique and frequency. Practicing some if you want to practice, if you want to get good at something, you practice it. You're better off practicing it daily, right? Rather than infrequently. If you go super hard, uh, you can't practice daily. So there's some differences between the two. Now I found, and this was something I figured out a while ago. When it came to you know my my clients, my everyday average people clients, I would train them you know twice a week with me, and then they would do stuff on their own. Now I couldn't monitor them on their own, and I noticed that when I'd give them exercises, they'd often sometimes they'd come back and they'd be a little tweaked or hurt, and it was because I wasn't there to monitor them. And I realized it was because they were working out without me. So I said, you know what, let's do this instead. And I would you know, John, why don't you instead of doing this workout with these four exercises? I want you to go to the gym and practice them. Just get really good at them. So go to the gym and just practice the skill of the exercises, and then I'll see you again on Thursday. And lo and behold, people started to train properly on their own. They worked out better. They got better results. They got stronger. They didn't hurt themselves. They didn't overdo it. And it was because they weren't so focused on how pumped and sore they could get, but rather you know the perfection of the technique and well, the skill. So that's the, that's what practicing a lift really is. I think a lot of times like momentum really sort of takes you outside of all the little nuances of things that are going on in terms of, you know, where I'm losing tension in my muscles, um, where, um, you know, my limbs, uh, whether my knees are traveling outward, whether, you know, I'm, I'm in good posture, like it, you do really do have to pay attention to a lot of things initially mm -hmm. uh, until you're really good at it and you're really proficient in in those those movement patterns and that takes a lot of practice uh, to be able to to program that into your subconscious where you could just naturally feel uh, those things get away from you and you can adjust on the fly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to be able to, and then when I said slow, that's really just to slow down, to be able to pay attention and, and, and really hyper focus in on uh, what your joints are doing, what your body is uh, providing feedback wise, and then start to kind of, you know, gradually move through it with, with smooth cadence and good mechanics uh, and then if it's, you know, you, you can work your way through even power type movements where you're, you're using a lot of speed and acceleration, um, but it all takes that, that hyper focus. And that's what the practice is all about. An example of what the, the mindset would look like going into a workout for me, if I'm going to go into lift versus going into practice, let's use squats as an example. So a basic basic programming there's exceptions to the rule but let's just say typical uh programming for squats is going to be three four or five sets and you're going to be working in the rep range of one to 20 somewhere in that that would be and i'm working out and i'm going to move a load that's going to be challenging relatively difficult for me regardless of whatever if that's going into workout to lift now let's say i did that on monday and i'm i want to practice my squats get better so i'm coming back in again on wednesday i'm still maybe even a little sore from that my my practice might look like 10 sets at really, really light, maybe 100 pounds or 135 pounds I'm moving. And I'm going to do higher reps and I'm just going to, or I'm going to, or maybe I'm going to do five reps, but mm -hmm. I'm going to slow it way down and, and feel my feet and pay attention to my knees at the bottom and work with a load that is so easy that I can slow the reps way down or pause in them or, or do 10 sets and not mm -hmm. do a lot of damage. So that's a, a practicing mindset for the same exercise versus going into it like I'm lifting or, or trying to. Yeah, most people will be better off practicing more off, more, more often than not and yes. training a little less often. That would be best for, it's like you're, you're, yep. you're 
you're, you have a mountain bike, you want to race your mountain bike in a competition, you don't go and you don't have any experience. So you should just go practice a lot rather than going and racing because you'll hurt yourself. You're not gonna be as fast. And the more you practice, the better you're going to compete, right? The more natural it's going to be. This is true for practicing uh, the skill of resistance training too. The more you practice, the better the workouts are going to be, right? So that's why this should never end. But for most people, if if 70 to 80% of the time you were in the gym, you just practiced your lifts and 20% of the time you actually trained, you'd get better results over the, over the long term than someone who did the reverse. I, I love that message because I think it's so opposite of what we hear in our space. Totally opposite. Our, in our space, it's so... Uh, if we, it's not intense, it doesn't That's right. We, we, we push the, the intense message so much. And I think that's why we came out with that, countering that. It's not that uh, it, intensity has a major factor with, with building muscle and it yeah. has tremendous value, but I also think that it's abused. I think that messaging that if you didn't have an intense workout, then it wasn't a great workout or you didn't get much bang for your buck out of it. And it's so not true. In fact, I agree with you. So I think that if you spent 80% of your time just practicing and only 20% of the time training intensely, I'm willing to bet you're going to get better results than the person who is training 80% intensely and only practicing 20% yep, of the time. Guaranteed. Next question is from Sally Samad 100. Can you drink protein shakes and creatine together after training or should they be taken at different times of the day? No, don't ever combine the two. You could, you could, cause <laughs> you could explode yeah, in your the stomach. The universe will implode. Your muscles actually go inside. Your <laughs> don't ever cross the streams. <laughs> actually, uh, great combination. So um, I've so, always found it interesting not a lot of protein powders just include yeah. that. Is there I a reason for that They time. used to. They used to. Really? Were, yeah, phosphagain, which was EAS's uh, protein shake, included creatine. I think it's because creatine is now so common that people probably already supplement with it. So they want pro if they want protein, they want protein. Right. Or I bet because you put the creatine in there, you would have to boost the price of the protein powder and then people would probably just Maybe. not buy it because yeah. they look at the compare. Now, now creatine um, is relatively well absorbed by most people, but there are things you can do to increase its absorption and its effectiveness. And one of them is to spike insulin. And there's a few different ways you could spike insulin. One is easy with like dextrose or sugar. Protein powders actually do this. So whey protein in particular, because of its quick absorption rate, you'll see a spike in insulin. And so that probably is going to increase the absorption um, of creatine. Creatine is great to take before uh, or after your workout too. You want it around the workout, that's going to increase its absorption and effectiveness. And then there's other ways you can increase the absorption of creatine. You can add um, sodium. So sodium helps the body uptake creatine. So I like to do, I like to throw it in my LMNT when I add it with water, cause that's got some, some, some sodium in there. And then alpha lipoic acid is a compound that you can take that'll help uh, increase its absorption. Does this make a huge difference? No, not a huge difference. But if you're like a real like fitness fanatic and you're real consistent and you really want to maximize everything you do, then I think it's, it, you know, with your post-workout shake, if you have protein, throw five grams of creatine in there and take it, and you'll increase its absorption over just taking it at any other times uh, of the day. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness or health goal. You can also find us on social media. So Justin and Adam are both on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. Adam is at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter. I got kicked off Instagram because my content is so fire. But you can find me on Twitter now at mindpumpsal.com. 